Yeah, and um, just for everyone here, excited to have our group together again and also to be able to show um, some of the work that's been going on for pretty much the last three months. But just ideally here, we'll be able to make this meeting some practical hands-on where we're going to go through um, some of the work of the team. And um, I think the contribution here will be getting feedback on the documents that have been put together. And the idea of this is um, haven't done like any kind of big rehearsal for this, just gonna use our group live to work through, um, yeah, the projects and, you know, any feedback and all feedback would be great on the documents that are put together. Cause you know, the goal of these documents will be to teach um, other developers how to do XR techniques. Um, and just to put some additional context on it as well, um, you know, we're, we're we all here believe that open source is really important for addressing some of the the challenges we're facing in XR accessibility. Because um, you know, we have at this point plenty of of guidelines and design resources. Um, you know, we have things like the meta virtual reality checks, but we don't have anything, any code for it. Right. If you want to make things accessible, you kind of have to do it from scratch. Uh, that's a big ask on a lot of developers, especially smaller developers that are trying to, you know, get whole new apps off the ground with limited staff. Um, and so the more of this that we can open source, the more that we can just make it so that people can just grab something and put it into their program and not have to, to reinvent the wheel. Um, the lower that barrier to entry gets to make things accessible. So we're really excited to, to kind of kick this off and um, just celebrate the the start of some uh, some new addition of some new open source code here. Yeah, and as one other like side note to this, um, I just this was not planned, but I ended up being in um, Brighton for the Unity like a developer meeting, and so it was a really good connection for. The future of this work, all the projects that we've done, you know, to date or that we'll be working on are going to be in Unity. Um, but got to meet some more of the um, developer evangelists that are working on um, teaching people how to use Unity. Um, I actually learned a lot about the Unity's whole support model is actually built around, you know, paying for developer support to get features implemented. So, I mean, this is just a really cool. I think what is built here is the exact scenario um, they're looking at. And when they did their roadmap for what's coming in the latest Unity, there was one mention of a built-in feature for vignettes for teleportation. So that's, again, an, a cool idea of like maybe, you know, one of the outcomes too that we would be really great from this work is that Unity actually adapts it into the Unity source code because it is open source, you know, and, and I think that'll be something too that we'll be trying to push is to um have have that be something that's turned on by default right so in the future it's even like hey developers do even less work uh, to make vr accessible so we got um a lot of people here today i think um just just to say that i think we want to use the time here to just dive into the the projects um and i think if you would like to um, use the raise your hand um feature uh we can call on you um as we go um I wanted to check with you, Raj or Savia. Do either of you feel like going first as the as the first yep. person here? Okay. I can go first. All right, we got a volunteer. Okay, so I'm gonna paste the link into the chat, everyone, for the document that uh Yuvraj has created. And if if it's possible for you to be following along um with the steps, that would be great. You know, that we want as much. Anyone that does have access to um, a machine that's running oops, uh, Unity, we're basically going to try to be following this documentation and, you know, taking your feedback anywhere in the documentation on how we can improve it. So take it away. Uh, you yeah. Cool. Thanks. Thanks for the link to the document. Uh, I hope I am audible to everyone. So, yes, good morning, good afternoon, good evening from all over the globe. Uh, let me quickly share my screen. Mm -hmm. So my screen is visible to everyone. 
I have uh, created a small presentation to take you along. So currently I am on a vision accessibility toolkit. I hope this is the same screen which you all are able to see. Yes. Right. Cool. So let's begin. Uh, so today I will be presenting uh, the vision accessibility toolkit which I have developed as a part of XR OS fellowship uh, in collaboration with XR Access and Equal Entry. So first I would like to uh, introduce uh, what I am doing and what is already existing. So I would like to begin with what is VRC. So VRC stands for Virtual Reality Check. And uh, so Virtual Reality Check refers to some set of guidelines which are provided by Meta to ensure that virtual reality applications meet certain standards. And uh, it has few of the accessibility uh, features mentioned in order to make the applications accessible to everyone. So in this presentation, I will be taking you through the VRC accessibility feature five. So feature five states that an application should be able, uh, it should enable people to edit their display settings such as brightness and contrast to accommodate their visual needs. So this feature allows user to adjust their visual settings within the VR application and uh, indeed enhance the visibility, readability and the comfort. So user can change their visuals contrast settings uh, within the application. So one can know more about uh, the VRC features here. I will just drop that in the chat box. So if anyone is interested, can look around some other VRC as well. So moving back to the presentation. Uh, this is the demo which uh, I have created. So you can see that this is the, uh, this VRC5 is currently implemented on Meta's first hand project. So first hand project is open source project by Meta. So I just pulled down the project, uh, added uh, this toolkit, which I created in that. And here are the results as you can see. So you can see that uh, a user is able to change various visual settings inside the app. So as you can see, now the complete app is in black and white field. So this is just altering the saturation feature. The user can change the temperature feature and tint feature as well in order to uh, get some other visual effects. And this is the change in hue shift. So hue shift I have added specifically for the color blindness. So the user which have a specific kind of color blindness, red, green, or blue, green, or some other type, they can toggle some hue shifts and can get rid of a complete set of color and other colors can be adjusted. So yeah, this is how the demo looks like. Uh, I would like to uh, take you further to like, how is this actually helping? So if we adjust the contrast settings, so it is able, it is making us able to improve the object clarity and UI visibility. The text is better readable. It is reducing the eye strain and providing uh, the environmental awareness. So if you observe here, this is how the initial game was looking like if you don't have the VRC5 implemented. So by default, uh, this is the game view. So it is quite hard to read what is written on the calculator. The numbers are not visible. However, if you just increase the contrast setting, then the clarity of the number, the readability is more. You can see what is written here. It's one, two, three, four. However, it's quite hard here. So this is how it is helping uh, other users to read. Uh, the saturation feature currently, uh, the one you saw. So it is uh, it, it is very useful for a specific condition known as achromatopsia. So this is a condition uh, in which the user uh, have partial or total absence of color vision. So in this scenario, people will be uh, like, either they cannot see complete colors or they can see only black and white uh, or shades of gray. So for that, if there is a application with so much of colors and user is unable to see, then uh, diminishing the saturation and taking it to the minimum level can make your actual application into black and white. Then we have the user, as mentioned, this is specifically developed for the people with uh, color blindness. So here I have mentioned three types of color blindness. One is fraternopia, deuteranopia, and retinopia. So fraternopia deals with 
a specific red color, so the user will not be able to see the red color. Whereas Dutenopia has a uh, difficulty in seeing green colors, and similarly Dutenopia has some difficulty in blue colors. So if you observe here, this is how the initial application looked like. But uh, changing the hue shift can you can remove the complete red color. So this is one example of removing the red color for Dutenopia type of uh, visual impact. So these two are the add-on features which are added as uh, temperature and thin. So these two feature allows the user to add some uh, emotional engagement with the external environment and the virtual VR environment. So changing this uh, can give give the user a stronger emotional connection with the virtual environment, and this flexibility of changing it uh, the visual presentation can uh, give. A more rich and more enjoyable VR experience to the user. So let's get on to the demo. Uh, let's try out the demo. We can try this out. So, how many of you are having the Oculus headset currently? Uh, maybe you can raise the hands. I can share this link in the chat. I have the APK. Uh, we can just install the APK and. Uh, get it experience uh, in life so one can experience this demo so so this will be one of the ideas right for everyone like um we're going to have you know and we do have the instructions for building it but as as we would do with you know working with any other vr developer we have the um APKs too. So if you have a tool such as SideQuest or a way to load uh, the APK onto your device, um, you can do that. I uh, see a hand with Shiva. Shiva, did you? Yeah. Okay. Hi. Yeah. Cool. So uh, you can uh, try this APK, and I would love to hear some feedback. Uh, I have added the instructions how you can run this APK. Uh, so it's uh, very simple. So like these are the features uh, which is added in the application. To install the APK, uh, one need to download the SideQuest application. And uh, once the SideQuest is installed, I can show you quickly. So we have the SideQuest application. We need to connect our Oculus uh, with the system. And here we have the option of uh, installing an APK from the computer. So if you click here to install, uh, the APK which is provided in the drive folder, one can download and just uh, drag and drop here and it, it should be accessible. So yes, with that, the APK will be installed on your machine. And I would love to hear the feedback. Oh. Uh, so moving ahead with how one can develop that in Unity. So here is the source code of the same. And that, that's another point just for our group here, but we're, we're working right on, you can see it's in the XR access initiative, but we're working to have right all these projects under our work here at XR Access. So this this is where um, they're going to be hosted. And that'll be something, you know, our group can also work on, on like socializing this GitHub uh, more to, you know, private and uh, universities, private in initiatives. So. Yeah, uh, so I have dropped down uh, the GitHub link as well. So one can actually take this down in the editor. So I would like to uh, take you through what specific changes I have did and what code I have written. So here we go. So this is the specific script uh, which I have written in order to uh, make the visual settings and get uh, give the user the ability to change it in life. So the thing which I'm using is the post processing effect so what post processing is uh, in simple terms we can say that uh, say we have an image and we are adding a filter on top of it so 
many of you might have used the snapchat so the filters what we had uh, the same effect is done here so once the object is getting rendered after that i am adding a layer on top of it and changing the colors so if i take you through the code uh, initially we are uh, i am just defining a volume so this volume is a global volume so the complete uh, post processing effects will be applied on the complete scene globally in the environment then uh, we have this color adjustment and white balance which is actually responsible for uh, contrast and saturation effects so the five slider components which you uh, saw in the video these are those five slider components and once we start the application this function start function is called we are assigning the global volume to a global profile and with that we are trying to extract the current color grading and white balance layer so once we are having those layers uh, we are just overriding the state so overriding state here means uh, i am allowing it to change the state from its previous to the next the newer state and then fixed update is being called once for every frame so once the application is running for every frame uh, the fixed update is getting called and for every update i am setting the new contrast and shift values so these five values i am setting it for every update and these values i am getting it uh, back from the slider values so here are some getter and setter functions so get function gives me the slider value for what value i am supposed to change the contrast value and set functions returns the contrast value back to the contrast values so similarly uh, it has been done for all the five values and at the end i have the reset button to reset everything to the initial state so yeah this is I have what... a question for you mm -hmm. uh, so was the um for the getting the volume profile was that the um the oculus system settings or was that um for the post processing settings well what was the one where you're getting the existing so, settings yeah so current settings what we are getting is the volume settings from the unity uh, okay. so it is from the unity and not from the oculus so in unity we are creating a global uh, cube on which a global volumetric cube on which we can apply all the post processing effects yeah and yes so i had a chance to uh, get this demo uh, used by few of the users so i have uh, some testimonials by them so i had here uh, sangeeta who said that i am truly impressed with the great work done to enhance uh, inclusivity for the visual impaired now we we all share the same experience creating a more inclusive world looking forward to even more exciting developments in the future i had one of my friend tabish imran who actually has the red green color blindness so he he finds it difficult to differentiate between red and green so i asked him to test the application and the feedback i got was uh, this the app is really cool and interesting for the first time users now with the options of visual controls the color seems more vibrant and comforting the control panel to select a desired color pattern is really helpful for someone like me with red green color blindness as now i am able to distinguish between objects of these colors which was difficult earlier so this was actually uh, helping him to the changing the hue shift was actually helping him to make color more visible and differentiate between the objects then we have uh, suvarna maji uh, she said that the options in the visual settings tab were pretty handy by adjusting a few settings i was able to custom enhance the view and my optical experience and last but not the least we have hemant nagasai who said that really amazed by the vr uh, experience what even more amazing is the ui settings available for adjusting saturation contrast and hue with the change in entire attire of the visuals this kind of customizations could make the user experience more smooth and pleasant and i really appreciate the amount of hard work went in creating this so yeah uh, that is what currently i am having in future we can look forward to add distance and size to 
size to it so the user uh, having say a app is having some text elements uh, at some distance there are some users who find it difficult to read at a distance so they can just grab that uh, text or something get them close and change the distance and also size uh, can be added in future so uh, if at all uh, any object is there close by even though it is not quite clear so user should have an ability to change its size minimize and uh, expand and as per the user so yeah uh, this was about the presentation i would like to take you through the document uh, how one can implement that so i hope everyone is having this link shared by uh, thomas so yeah uh, so in order to implement this brc5 uh, the article will take you through the process of implementing this into the oculus headset so we will be implementing this brc5 in the current demo what you saw the first hand application uh, this has been developed by meta and it is open source so one can actually go and uh, see see and uh, clone it in their site so first we download the first hand project and open it in the unity editor uh i have it already open in my system um i'm going to take a quick note too just to make sure mm -hmm. we explain that to the group that you know one of the one of the other principles in here of why we were using first hand project is so we had a cool user interface. So that's where we're getting people started. But then the idea will be for people using this article, you know, to apply it into their project. And so this is showing like applying it into first hand. But the idea to for teaching to other people is, hey, you can take this code and take it right into your, you know, you get the same functionality just in a different project. Yep, exactly. So this is developed like a toolkit. One can uh, just uh, Thing, uh, download that prefab from the GitHub and get added in any of the application. So uh, we have to just make sure that uh, we have this uh, Oculus integration package. So for the current application, it comes up uh, directly uh, fr from the first hand application. They have already added it. So in order, if one want to apply this display settings in any of the project, so here we are applying it on the first hand. So I have created this prefab, which uh, one can just download and install it. So like, this is the prefab. Uh, you can just download the prefab, take it to Unity, and this is the script which I have just uh, taken you through uh, the GitHub. So this create script and the prefab, once it is added on any of the Unity project, uh, the thing is done. The VRC5 is implemented on that thing. Uh, this, it will require uh, some more steps in order to uh, integrate. And uh, those steps will be, uh, so once you have downloaded that VRC5, uh, user needs to uh, do some modifications on the Unity side. So the first thing what he has to do is create a new volume profile from the inspector. So here it is. This is the VRC5 prefab, uh, which you will be uh, getting uh, from the drive. And uh, in the global volume, you have to just add a new profile. So once a new profile is added, then uh, user, uh, the developer is supposed to add some overrides. So here is how one can add it. I will just quickly take you through. Uh, click on add overrides, post processing, and you can add any of the post processing effect which you want. So currently we will be uh, dealing with uh, the two post processing, which is color adjustment and white balance. And make sure to enable all the features of uh, this color adjustment and white balance. So the document states the same. Uh, we add the color adjustment features and select all the features of color adjustment and uh, white balances as shown. Then, uh, then we connect the created UI with the laser hand for interacting.
And also, um, I'm just going to give you like a five minute warning here, you rush for, for your time for today's meeting, but this is going great. Uh, we oh. might have lost. This uh -oh. topic. <laughs> oh. Yeah, the the perils of uh, worldwide meeting. Yeah. <laughs> oh, there is. Okay. Sorry for that. I was just uh, saying was five minutes, minutes left. You rush, so 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 we'll just get as much as we can in five. Okay. Ah, yeah. So, yeah. Okay, we are back on the same page. Yes, we can yes. see yours. Yes. So, uh, so we were here uh, to add that visual settings. Yeah, to make this UI interactable, uh, we just uh, do a modification that uh, on when hit target. So this is the laser beam, which which is the pointing the blue beam what you saw, and when you enable this when on when it targets, so whenever the user points the hand on this UI, the laser beam will start interacting with it. So doing this will enable you to interact with the display settings with ray coming out from your right hand. And later, uh, you need to just add the camera thing to the inspector window. So click on the visual setting present in the hierarchy and drag and drop the uh, center eye anchor to the screen. So here in the UI, for the U UI, here we are supposed to add the center eye anchor in order to see it, see this UI in the world space. So you can find that in the player settings, input VR. Uh, yeah, OVR camera rig, tracking space, and center eye anchor. This is what you are supposed to add. Add that back in the visual settings event camera. So this is what the step says. Uh, and next, we uh, drag and drop the visual settings script which we created to the inspector window, and assign all the components to the respective uh, field in that. So what what that means is. Uh, we have the visual settings here, and we have this uh, global volume contrast and the five features. So this we are supposed to link it with the actual objects present. So here in the visual settings, we have this contrast. So we are supposed to drag contrast to the contrast field, saturation to the saturation field, and respectively all other fields in the same fashion. So doing that will uh, link the slider with the script and it will be able to send the value to the getter and setter functions which uh, we discussed before so yes once once it is done we are just supposed to uh, assign that uh, each functions to the particular slider values so like click on the no function in the visual settings and get contrast function so what does uh, that means is uh, we have here the contrast thing and once we add the visual settings to it we are supposed to choose the get contrast function the one we created in the visual settings script and this will link the function and the slider values together so the developer is supposed to follow the step 13 and 14 dragging and dropping uh, the object and changing the function for all other elements and yeah that's it if uh, we are done with uh, 15 steps we will be able to implement the vrc5 into the application so this is how one can see if it is actually enabled or not so what meta sta meta states for verifying is the vrc5 actually implemented is not is to test it manually, launch the application, check the display setting, and confirm that we are able to change the brightness and contrast. So the expected result, what we got is this. Yes, we are able to change the brightness and contrast. And this is how it is helping the user with 
visual impairments uh, to get better accessibility. So okay, well, as we discussed, you, Raj, we got one great question here, and then we'll we'll just end with this. But you know, everyone else, please yeah. like if you type in the questions, we'll get back to these for future ones. But a uh, question from um, Ren around um, you know the interface only using sliders. Um, so like an alternative that's open for future work. But a question I had is, could you use the Unity editor to set all of the values without using the slider? Could you set them to different numbers? From the editor itself? Yes. Could you could you use the Unity editor to set the values without having to use the sliders? Um, is, is there a way to set them like in the code inspector? Okay. Yeah, good. Yes, okay. so it is possible. Uh, I can show you that slide. So this is the slider what uh, we have mm -hmm. added. So you can see the slider is representing to a specific number, which is varying between minus 100 and 100. So indirectly by the slider, what we are fetching back to the script is the floating numbers. So these are just the numbers. So one can actually type the number and uh, send it back to the C hash site. So yes, that can be done. And that is what is happening internally. Great. So we'll make a note on that one. And then we'll just say like, thank you so much for the presentation today. I mean, this is the first of several presentations on this project to everyone here in the group. So um, thank you so much, Yuvraj. And um, we'll, we'll go to our next uh, presentation. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. And yeah, if you've typed more questions, you Raj can see them all here in the chat. It'd be great. So if you have some other points, just type them in the chat and then also we can follow up in future meetings. All right. So now, uh, Savio, are you ready to go? Um, yeah, I am. Okay, great. Uh, I'll also share my screen quickly. Can you see my presentation? Yes. All right. Uh, hey, everyone. Um, I'm Savio, um, and I'm also an XROS fellow who worked with XR Access on this project. Um, so uh, me, like your branch, also worked on uh, a VRC. So I worked on implementing a VRC, or a virtual reality check uh, from Meta, which is like a recommendation uh, from Meta on how to make your apps more accessible. So I focused on VRC1, which says that an application should be playable in its entirety without the use of audio by providing subtitles uh, or like sound effects uh, for in-game uh, dialogue or sound effects. So basically, I focused on captions for VR. Um, so captions in VR are different from captions for 2D content, because in 2D content, you're always like looking at the same spot in space, like a TV screen. But in VR, um, you can basically look around uh, in a 360 degree angle. You can look anywhere. So this brings up uh, challenges when it comes to how to position captions in VR. So um, it's a bit more challenging than 2D. And now um, there are many different VR games which have captions and they have approached this problem from different um, angles. So here we can see Half-Life Alex. And here you can see that the captions always follow the user's gaze. So wherever the user is looking, the captions always um, are in front of you. So it follows your gaze. Now there are different ways of handling this. So in Vacation Simulator, um, you can see a bit more of a complex system where the captions are actually attached to a speaker. And when you look away from the speaker, the captions move with you. So this is a different way of uh, handling captions. Now, there is no one correct way to do captions in VR. Um, the solution always like depends on the context of your specific app and um, what exactly you're trying to, what kind of experience you're trying to create. So it's important that the caption positioning that you use um, provides options so that uh, you know people can um, adjust it to their liking um, and also make sure that it, it suits your experience. So. Uh, for this project, I created um, a caption system for Unity. Um, I call it Chirp Captions. It's a random name I came up with. Uh, and the idea is that this is a caption system and that serves as a, a common sort of system which can support multiple ways of positioning captions. Uh, so the idea is that it's customizable and extendable so that people can 
easily adjust it to their liking and set up captions exactly how they want them. Uh, and it's also open source, uh, and I've published it in the XR Access uh, Slack or, or the GitHub. Uh, I'll show you a quick demo of what the captions look like uh, for now. So here I'm opening a demo of the app that I created. Oh, it doesn't let me seek, so I'll have to play through it. So this is just a quick demo in which there are a couple of characters who speak um, and uh, captions appear in front of you. And the specific caption system or the positioning mode that I'm using here is headlocked captions. So here you can see that the captions always follow your gaze. Um, so uh, it's kind of similar to the Half-Life Alex system that we saw before. And this is called headlocked captions. Now, now that I've shown you a quick demo of the uh, the caption system or what it looks like. I would like to dive a bit more into the detail, like the code of how it's implemented. So I will share my entire screen now. Uh, and here I have um, a quick sort of uh, structure of how the caption system works. So this is a bit of a technical um, and assumes that you have a bit of knowledge on how Unity works, the scripting. So uh, the caption system is mainly implemented with this main script called caption system. Um, and it works together with another script called caption render manager. And this forms the backbone of the caption system. Um, and basically how it works is um, any game object that provides audio. So any game object that has an audio source would also have a corresponding caption source. Um, and the caption source uh, is sub, uh, responsible for providing captions to this render manager. And here, the posi different positioning modes are implemented as modules so that you can turn off and on um, a specific caption positioning mode, depending on what you want. So the idea is that um, the system is extendable so that if you want to create a new sort of uh, positioning mode, then you can easily do it um, without affecting the entire system. And it also provides uh, options that you can um, adjust. So the main script provides uh, different options that are common to the entire system. So things like font size and font color can be adjusted here. And each individual caption renderer also provides you um, options that are specific to that renderer. And that's how it looks overall. Um, I'd also like to walk you through how to implement this caption system in one of your own VR projects. So here, um, I have written a, a sort of write-up for how to implement this in Oculus's Whisper sample. Um, this is a sample that um, lets you kind of try out voice commands in VR. And we chose this sample for the captions because it has a narrator who speaks certain lines. And if you if you are deaf or hard of hearing, then it would probably be this app would be inaccessible to you by default because the narrator doesn't have subtitles. So um, I'll show you how to add subtitles for the narrator. Um, and I'll just share a link to this document in the chat so that you can also. Oh, it uh, looks there. like Tom it it in. OK, cool. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. Right. So the first step you need to do is to clone the Whisper project from the Oculus GitHub. So I've already done this here. Um, and I'm not sure if you will be able to follow along, uh, if it's feasible to follow along for this. Um, this demo because uh, Unity kind of takes time to import things and it's probably not fast enough. So I'll just show you how I do it here. I already have the project open here in Unity. Uh, and this is just the basic project. Um, by default, there's no captions or anything. Um, I would show you how it looks without captions, but then it's probably just a waste of time. Uh, OK, so. Uh, let me get this out of the way. OK, the first step we need to do is to install the Chirp caption system. Now, the caption system is provided as a package, a Unity package that you can easily install using this link. So Unity has this cool feature where you can install a package from a um, GitHub repository. So you just have to open Package Manager and click this plus icon here, add package from Git URL, and then it will add the package. 
takes a little while to import stuff. Um, and still takes a while. Okay. Now, while that um, does that, we'll look at the next step. So here, it shows you how to import the package once it's um, installed, how to add it to your project. So now it's installed here, and I'll go to the packages folder here in the project window. And I, here I have chirp captions, and within that I have a folder called prefabs, which has a convenient prefab that you can use to just import. So I'll just drag it into my project here. And here I can see that it has the caption system script that I talked about and the other script. Um, the first thing that you need to do is to um, assign your main camera to this script. So I'll find the main camera here in the player rig, height offset, camera offset, and here's the main camera. So I just have to drag it into the caption system. I have to do the same thing for the audio listener as well. And now um, the initial part is done. Here you can also see that the caption system has some common options like the font size, the font type, color, and things like that. Um, so let's see what the next step is. Yeah, once we have we have done this, um, one of one of the next steps is to add a layer called captions. So because captions always appear in front of other objects uh, in your project. Um, then you have to add a new layer for captions. You can do that by going to project settings um, and tags and layers. Go to layers and then just add a layer called captions. Right. Uh, okay. And the next step is to understand how your project works. So the, what we want to do here is to add captions to the narrator's audio lines. So the narrator has a certain audio lines and Whenever the narrator speaks, um, you have to show the corresponding captions. So here, if, if you're working with your own project, you probably know how the audio files are, are called and played. But in this case, I had to kind of figure out how Oculus did this. Um, so how, how are the audio files organized in this project? So with a bit of digging around, I found that um, it has this game object called audio uh, within which there is a audio manager script. And within this um, is a set of sound libraries. And here you have the sound library for the narrator for level one, level two, etc. So when you inspect this um, sound library, you can see that there are different clips that the audio uh, that correspond to our voice lines for the narrator. So there's a clip for intro. You can see that there's an audio clip there. There's another intro. So the idea is that we would add a corresponding caption file to each of these audio clips. Uh, okay, so so to do that, um, I actually used um, OpenAI's Whisper, which is like um, uh, Whisper, which is a text uh, speech to text uh, AI, which lets you generate text captions out of audio files. Um, there's this convenient uh, UI for it on GitHub. It's called Buzz, which just lets you open up a text, uh, an audio file, and generate a corresponding subtitle file for it. So I used it um, to create a lot of subtitle files for uh, all of these audio files. Um, now let's see how to uh, actually add it to this project. So to do that, we have to edit the sound library script first. And here we can see that there's a list of audio clips and corresponding to this list of audio clips, we have to add a list of subtitle files. So here, I have this line of code here, which basically adds a subtitle file to it. And then I save it. Okay. And once that is compiled, you will see that uh, the inspector now shows a new field for subtitles. So here you can add a subtitle text asset. 
So I'll just add two text assets here. Now, I already generated these files before, um, but you can just do it with Buzz like I uh, showed you. So these are basically SRT files, which have timing information for um, uh, captions. So these are like the common standard for movies and TV shows. Uh, it lets you define subtitles along with their timings. So I'm just using a subtitle file, but um, I just renamed it to TXT because Unity doesn't allow you to import SRT files, but it lets you import TXT. So I'll just import these two files uh, here. I have them here, and now here I can, in the sound library, I can just assign this file here. Uh, okay, now in the document, I skipped forward a bit, but um, I'll go back uh, here. Now, one of the important things that you have to do is to add a caption source to uh, the narrator or whatever, whatever source of audio that you have. So here, um, you can see that the project already has an audio source for the narrator. Uh, and corresponding to uh, this audio source, I would just add a caption source script which auto auto fills with the uh, right values so you don't have to do anything else there um, and now what's remaining is that we have done this step uh, now what's remaining is to actually call uh, or pass on the subtitles from the srt files to the uh, caption source um, i'm doing this by intercepting what actually uh, the project does when it comes to play back, playing back audio. So it does that by um, this audio manager script. And here you can see there's a line of code which says um, narrator source .play one shot clip data. So it's this line of code um, which actually plays an audio clip for the narrator. So what I do here is in addition to just playing this audio clip, um, I would also play a caption corresponding to it. So here I'm just using some of code, some of the code that I've written before. Uh, I'll just copy paste it because it's uh, faster than writing. Uh, so what I'm doing here is basically figuring out which audio clip is being played and to find a corresponding subtitle file for it, and then um, I'm just playing that there using this uh, function or coroutine called play subtitles which I will also add to the script. Yep. Now, now you'll see there's a lot of red lines here. This is because I haven't imported the right um, libraries for this to work. So here I'm using something called SRT parser, which is a third party um, script, which lets you parse an SRT file because Unity doesn't do that by default. So I'll also add the necessary imports here. So I'm just using simple SRT, and this is the actual caption system. So this is how you import the caption system package in your scripts. Now, I still have to add this script because I haven't um, added it. This is available on GitHub. Um, there's a link to it in the document. So this is from another person. Um, who wrote a script to read SRT files in Unity. So I already have this in a different folder, so I'm just going to add that from there for ease of use. Uh... Okay. And now you'll see that all of the errors are gone and hopefully um, the project works. So that's basically what you have to do, all you have to do. Uh, and now if I play the project, there's a bunch of splash screens. You can look around 
And you can see that captions appear for the narrator's lines. And it follows you wherever you look because um, this is headlocked captions. Yeah, now um, that was the demo. Um, there's also one more thing that I missed out. Can you do that one again? Sorry, can you do the headlocked captions? Just oh, sure. Little... Yeah, let's do that. Yeah. Too. Basically, I'm just emulating a VR headset in the editor. So if I were to put on the VR headset, then it would follow me wherever I look. So here, I'm just doing it with the mouse. Great. Yeah. Thanks. Um, also, there's a little thing that I missed out. Is that so? This is the actual script that I'm using to the code that I'm using to play a subtitle. Now, the important line here is this source dot show timed caption. So, source is basically the caption source that we basically added before uh, to the narrator. This the caption source here. Uh, and this function basically sends a bunch of text to this. Uh, source along with the duration. So that's what actually tells the caption system to show certain text for a certain amount of time. Um, so all of this code is basically to uh, process the SRT file that we pass in, um, extract the lines of text along with their timing information, and then pass it on to the caption um, system. Uh, and I'll also show you a quick demo of how the options look like uh, in uh, um, in here. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm quick question here. Uh, how much work would, would have to be done to adapt this were we to get those captions from a real time source? Um, so right now the caption system only supports timed captions, but real time, there is a possibility for it. I've added some sort of like groundwork for it, but it's not a feature yet, but it could very well be a feature in the future. Yeah. This is just a quick demo of how it how the options look. So you can change the font style, the size, like the colors of um, every element, like the background and the text. And you can also adjust uh, the delay with which captions move around. So you can have it follow your gaze immediately or with a certain small delay. And uh, the caption options, you can adjust them from the UI, like a UI that you can create, or there's also the possibility to just do it from the editor here. So you can also just do it from here, from the inspector. Uh, but you can also like plug in values uh, to this using a script. Uh, yeah, that was a quick overview of the caption system. Uh, I hope I was clear enough. <laughs> Um, yeah, uh, this, is, this is great. You know, I, I was going to emphasize, I mean, I think the work that you have in there for the SRT part is really cool because from the work that I've seen in Unreal, <clears throat> they don't really have that in the explanation, but that is, you know, the file format that most people that produce captions are used to working in. So I think, um, yeah, that that's built into the sample is good. It would let people that might not do VR, but do the captioning work together yeah with one in vr um yeah and and Savia, one thing i missed um when it comes to the locations of the creature you know the, the the speakers right that's not something that's in a typical srt file right yeah. um could you sorry if i missed it could you go show one more time how you assigned those locations to the different uh different people yeah definitely i'll share my screen again so here I talked about um, the uh, caption source. So each different object that provide, that generates audio uh, also has a caption source associated with it. So here the narrator is a game object which has the caption source. Um, then the music would 
if if I were to add sort of like descriptions for the music, then I would also add a caption source here. Uh, so that's how the game knows like where is the source of an uh, a caption is from the game object itself, um, and you basically send fun commands to these caption sources. Like if the narrator speaks, if there's a code that you use to play um, audio for the narrator, you would also send the corresponding captions from that code. So basically you can determine what captions go to which source and that determines like where the location is and uh, the caption system just knows the location from the game object. Great, and that's identified via uh, the source label should match what's in the SRT file? No, this is just um, a visual thing. So if you want okay. the narrator to have like narrator in front of every line that they speak, then you would just add a label here, but it's not uh, gotcha. necessary. Or would that be, would that be like editable in the, like if, if the uh, person knew to use a certain formatting that you could use the label to direct it? Yeah. Me. Okay. Yeah. It's it's at this point it's a quite rudimentary version of like yeah, uh, speaker no. identification, but um, there's a I don't know if you noticed like in the uh, demo video you also, you can also see arrows. So the arrows actually point to which speaker is currently speaking. If you look away from them. Oh. So that's uh, another way of identifying caption uh, the speaker. There's multiple ways of doing it, and um, I don't know. I think it's important to provide options and example implementations so, so that people can know or like use whatever is best for them. Yeah, I, I think too. From speaking just in a project, Merrill Evans and I have been working on yet. Yeah, I think we're we're definitely going to have the trade offs. Um, certain people are going to prefer different ones and I think you know like I'm someone that doesn't get motion sickness so some techniques where they might cause motion sickness in some people they might be better for people that don't get motion sickness but given that you know a, a large percentage of people do get motion sickness is like we're never I don't think in VR we're going to have a like single way to produce it so yeah it's really cool that you have the customization yeah Options. And as for the future of this, um, right now the code is available on GitHub, um, but it currently only has uh, one positioning mode, that is the headlock caption mode. So there's definitely potential to add more positioning modes. Uh, I would love to see a mode like you know the vacation simulator one, which is a bit more complex, uh, but certainly doable in Unity. Um, so. Um, yeah, that's the future of the project. So if it ends up like gathering uh, interest, then definitely I can see scope for developing more positioning modes in it. And I, I know there's there's a very interesting question when it comes to the future of captions um, as to whether we're going to need a new standard of captions that has like those coordinates kind of baked in, right, in some way, shape or form, because um, you know, if you're in, for example, a, a 360 video or something that doesn't have like unique objects that can be assigned to those things, mm -hmm. it's like, how do you, uh, indicate where, what's the location of the people that are, that are talking as it, as it goes. Mm -hmm. So, um, something I think we'll, we'll, uh, I know we, at some point we wanted to talk to like three play media and some of the other like caption, big captioners about. Yeah. Um, I think uh, when it comes to interactive applications uh, like games and Unity apps, um, the positioning can be in the game's code itself, and it doesn't have to be like a standardized thing like an SRT. But I can definitely see that being useful for 360 video and 360 content, which mm -hmm. is not interactive, yeah. All right. Well, great. Thank you so much, Savio. Excellent presentation. And, you know, again, same same message here, everyone. There'll be more presentations on this topic. And yeah, thanks for everything today. And we'll hand it over to Shivam for the um, last presentation of today. And hopefully with a little bit of time to talk about open source at the end. Hello. Am I audible? Yes, you are.
Okay, hello everyone. My name is Shivam and I'm also an Ekdareo Salo. And I am working on locomotion in VR for people with disabilities. So I'll just share my screen. So is my screen visible? Yes. Yep. Okay. So as we know, XR is extended reality and it covers augmented reality, virtual reality and mixed reality. And we are targeting virtual, virtual reality in this domain. So my role is uh, working in the locomotion sector and VR, VR plays a crucial role in helping people with disabilities in various ways. It immersive and interactive nature opens up possibilities for accessibility, empowerment and various other uh, to improve the quality of life of individuals with mob mobility impairments. So what is locomotion in VR? Locomotion in VR basically the way you move around in a virtual environment. So commonly there are three types of locomotion that is teleportation, smooth locomotion and room scale movement. So teleport is basically you point and teleport to a, one from one point to another point and smooth in smooth locomotion you are continuously moving from point A to point B using your virtual controllers or thumbsticks. In room scale movement, you are physically moving like you are moving in a real world. And the last uh, case that is room scale movement, it is not recommended to use because it is dangerous and you might bump into some sharp object in your room and you might get injured. So for this VRC, we are focusing on teleportation and smooth locomotion. And I strongly believe that by harnessing the power of immersive technology, VR can, can uh, contribute to a more inclusive and empowering world in which all the oh. might have some technical difficulties here. Shivam, you there? We lost. It looks like the current went in that area. Ah. Uh, well, why don't we give him a moment to reconnect? Um, we can open it up for some uh, either questions on the previous two presentations or can talk about uh, open source in general, because I think that I know for us at XR Access, um, the, all the work we've been talking about so far fits into an initiative we've been calling the, the prototype for the people project. Um, I'll put a link to that, but it's effectively trying to have open source solutions, not just for you know, these three, but for every part of uh, XR accessibility, including the parts that haven't don't really have clearly defined answers yet. Um, so I'd love to to hear people's uh, feedback, suggestions on you know who should be making all of the, this open source uh, projects. What can we do to make them more successful? Um, oh, hold on, is that Shivam back? She popped up. Uh, maybe. Okay. Let us know if you hear Shivam. Um, but yeah, let, well, let's for for the moment then open it up to the floor and and hear what uh, folks have to say. In that one. What was that, Valerie? Oh, okay. I, I now, did want to call back to, you know, one of Christine Marsh's comments that in, in earlier in the chat of talking about like Unreal Engine, and that's something definitely to think about for open source, you know, these are all going to be unity based, but right, like that idea of open sourcing solutions, you know, it's it's like not that we're only doing unity. So I think that's an interesting place to for looking at prototype for the people is like go for other grants and or opportunities with Unreal Engine. We we do want to affect like all the developer tools um, with these solutions. So I just wanted to bring that up that that's a good comment. And you know, we're unity focused in today's presentation, but 
you know, we've done some A-frame things in the past and, you know, we, we need to keep affecting all the platforms. Definitely. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, there's another interesting element to me is um, when it comes to academia, there's there's a lot of open source code in academia, right? Like oftentimes people who are working on research projects will publish their code along with their paper. Um, but you tend to end up with a whole bunch of kind of one-off prototypes and not like consistently maintained systems, but it, it could form the basis for one, right? You know, I'm, I'm specifically thinking about um, seeing VR, uh, the seeing VR toolkit, which was an amazing set of tools uh, for now a quite deprecated version of Unity um, that uh, Yuheng Zhao and uh, a bunch of folks from Microsoft as well really collaborated on um, back at Cornell a few years ago. Uh, and that had like all of these amazing vision accessibility tools. But now if you want to use that, you kind of have to to reinvent it, you know, port portion the code over one person at a time and see which works with the latest version of Unity. So um you know, that's that's I think one one challenge is um trying to take these great things that people make and keep it up to date. Um and that takes consistent effort. Um perhaps you know, oftentimes funding if people aren't working on it on a volunteer basis. Um, so any any ideas people have of, you know, that or, or if anybody here has experience with open source projects that like have been maintained over time um, through various platform updates, um, I'd love to, to hear from folks. Yeah, so now I'll just add in to what Dylan's saying while we're waiting for anyone else. But I think if we did get this, uh, I mean, like my next goal would be that we could try to have, um, you know, realistically to go through these projects and have people do them. These are probably like two hour classes each, right? You know, so for a professor or someone teaching um, a group of students, you know, I think it's very cool that we now have like, you know, these are really much longer uh, courses of what we've seen here in the 30 minutes and those would let people um, build on top of them and you know ideally that's one way I think of fostering it is just we have to make sure that we're getting them used by um, more people and I think a good way to do that is through like a classroom setting and something maybe too we could think about with XR access to have a special event where we do like a classroom type setting um, and do that we haven't I don't think done that before for doing um, coding, but the same way people look at it as like a hackathon. Um, yeah, I, I do see these being like much more involved <laughs> courses to get people really doing the work and multiple hours of work. Yeah, I know that's one of the things we we're thinking about on the XRX side is, is doing more um, like professional development work, like trying to find partners in the universities or boot camps to make a proper course out of uh, accessibility for XR. Uh, so it's something in the, the near future, perhaps. All right, I'd love to hear from from some of the other attendees here. Um, you know, I, if if uh, either answers to the previous questions or some new questions, right? Like for for folks here that are attending, what's something that that you're excited about when it comes to open source? Something that that you want to see? A quiet crowd today. <laughs> uh, uh, I don't know. If, button. Oh, what was that? Unmute button. Yeah, does anyone? I mean, we had some comments in here. Okay. <laughs> oh, sure. Go Hi, Christian. Yeah, we're we're just talking about uh, what what are people's kind of goals for for open source. Um, yeah, I'd, I'd love if you want to speak to the the Unreal perspective. I know there's some. Um, uh, like we said, this you know this project is for Unity, but we certainly know there's a lot of people to develop in Unreal, and we want to make sure they have open source to draw from as well. Hi, can you hear me? Yeah. 
Wonderful. So, uh, yeah, actually, the, um, I, sorry, I haven't been in these meetings for a little while because the, the time keeps conflicting with my schedule, but I'm glad you guys moved it to the middle of the day. In this particular case, I'm able to join. And this is a great example of exactly the sort of thing that we're trying to accomplish with uh, both the interactive uh, and immersive project that I'm working on at the moment, um, which is a fairly, fairly high profile project that has a bigger scope, but the accessibility is a component of it. Um, but also uh, work that I'm trying to do with university that I teach for, for Bowie State, um, to make sure that the content that we create with our virtual uh, university, as well as uh, other VR, AR projects are also uniformly um, and universally accessible. So I would hope, you know, as part of this um, endeavor that the content that we create, it wouldn't be proprietary, that we would create it for the benefit of, of everyone. So the, the intention is to make it open source and, and hopefully have a group, like a consortium of people that can carry the torch, you know, beyond the, the scope of just the university's effort that we could maybe just instigate it, but then it could, it could carry on uh, after that in a wider group. This is why I keep asking this question of this group, because this group seems to be a group of people that would do that sort of thing. But it, to, to date, it seems most of your focus has been on unity. So I'm always the person in the background saying, what about Unreal Engine? <laughs> so, <laughs> but that's my intention anyway, to answer your question. Yeah, and I think there's there's it's a good it's a good definitely a good point to raise because um, like you said there's plenty of folks that are working on Unreal. I know there was some some amazing work uh, by uh, Zohar Ghan and Unreal for the uh, accessibility object model stuff. Um, I guess one thing I, I'm curious about is thinking about kind of distribution of open source code. I know for Unity you can make uh, like plugins and things and kind of put that on the the Unity Asset Store and whatnot. I'm sure there, there must be an Unreal equivalent to that, right? Uh, yeah, there's a there's an Unreal Marketplace um, mm. that's where plugins can be distributed and can be given for free. Um, there's, there's a ton of free uh, content out there. You can also put it on sort of a neutral third party site I mean, in addition to github it could also go into something like gumroad or or one of those other locations to to promote it and and have it be more accessible uh is that is that your question as far as the distribution of something like that that would be a, a free model yeah 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 absolutely yeah. Yeah, and there are of course other platforms besides Unity and Unreal too. There's uh, you know AFrame, um, you know AR Core and AR Kit on mobile. Um, there's uh, I'm sure others that that escape me at the moment, but um, it'd be good things to to think about as well. You know, I, there's I think that's one of our goals in doing this project was that not only do we have the code itself, but we have these articles that kind of gives a little bit of the play-by-play -play, so hopefully you can then like translate that into how you do it on other platforms um but there's always that that uh question of do we make it broad enough that you can do it on any platform but you have to figure it out or do we make it narrow enough that you can do it very easily on this platform by following the instructions but it's a little bit more specific yeah, and another example with Unreal again that um, I mean, the only one that I have because it's the project I worked on, but I guess I think there's always that opportunity for us to try to work and meet the people that are in these roles at the company because Unreal does have a subtitle feature. The engine actually has like some small documentation on it, but there's really no video created from Unreal about it. And the only ones that were teaching you about it that I'd found at the time I did the work. Um, were some YouTube videos with, you know, very low viewership. So it's like good that they were created, but um, where with Unreal, for example, like, you know, collaborating with a group like ours, maybe we help them build up um, the work that they're doing so that there are better examples or like more teachable examples of how to use the features that they're developing and design. Uh, also, when I see to 
sorry, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. I, I was just going to say to that end, you know, maybe it would be something for us to to take that conversation kind of offline uh, to coordinate with some people at Unreal. I, I don't know if you guys are already talking to them, but um, or Epic, I should say. Um, but I do have some some connections to those folks. I'm working with them on a project, so I could. I could, if you want, make an introduction and maybe we could, that's why I was thinking about the, the grant thing that you, you mentioned earlier, Thomas, that yes. maybe that's a, a, some, a group sort of effort that we could um, start here in the near future and, and move forward with to, well, I, both with Epic and this group and maybe a couple of universities and colleges that could also help carry the flag forward um, within their own group so if we needed more hands on keyboards essentially you know to to help develop this that that could be something too that it could be uh like a r d effort with a couple of universities just a thought it might work yeah no I, absolutely and I, I think i mean one of the challenges of this type of thing is always funding right because coding takes time and and a lot of effort and so we want to make sure that that if people are working on that they can keep you know for the bills so if we could manage to get a unreal grant for that i think that'd be a fantastic way to to push the project forward so we'll definitely we'll definitely connect offline christine okay thanks uh, okay and it looks like shivam is back so shivam do you want to go ahead and resume uh just think about locomotion we got uh, about so apologies everybody minutes. sorry for the disconnect i'll just share my screen again is my screen visible Okay, okay. So uh, we were talking about locomotion, mainly three type of teleportation, smooth and room skill. And in our project, we'll be using teleportation and smooth locomotion. So what are the advantages of VR locomotion for people with disabilities? So first of all, it will help in remote and work, uh, remote work and collaboration. VR collaboration tools can enable people with mobility disability to remotely and participate in virtual meetings and conferences. It can also help in physical rehabilitation, interactive accessibility training, which can provide interactive training modules for businesses to understand the needs of people with mobility disabilities. And it, also, it will also help in accessible tourism and virtual travel. So VR can offer virtual tour of various destinations and historical settings with the individuals and they can visit the places without having the difficulty of accessing it physically. It will also help in gaming entertainment. They can adapt with players with mobility and uh, move throughout the gaming area and play. And it, uh, they, it will also help in virtually attending events and gatherings where it is not possible to physically visit. It will be helpful for them. At the end, it will also be really helpful in emergency preparedness. So they can prepare for, uh, they can simulate different, different environments in which they can have a specific drills to develop a better understanding for accessibility emergency roads. So we working on open source development so that we can share our knowledge and resources and also help in rapid innovation and development in this space. So these are some of the open source development tools that we can access. And there are also many tools in the XRFS GitHub. So specifically, my VRC was VRC8 that focuses on multiple locomotion style. That is uh, teleportation, snap turning, and free locomotion. So I'll just show you a preview of how it works. So I've taken Meta's first hand app project and implemented snap turning, teleportation and direct motion. So these are the controls. So basically snap turning is uh, rotating uh, the camera without moving your neck. So if I want to see right, I can just move the thumbstick and my camera will turn. Like this, uh, in this video, I'm turning left without rotating my head. And the next is direct motion. 
in which you can directly move throughout the space using the controllers without physically moving in the real world. The disadvantage of this uh, locomotion is that it causes motion sickness. And the next is teleportation. So this is the most recommended one in all the locomotion techniques. So using teleportation anchor, you can move throughout the uh, screen and uh, you can have different teleportation anchors placed at different places so that you can travel throughout the scene easily. So this also causes less motion sickness at, as you are not getting aligned to the virtual world, you are just teleporting from one point to another. Another uh, use case of this is, we can even teleport and change and select the orientation. So what I mean by that is we can teleport from point A to point B and we can even see the orientation like uh, which way we are facing after getting teleported. So in this video, if you see clearly, I am also selecting the orientation in which I'll be facing after getting teleported. So this will be very helpful in puzzle game also, as you'll be, uh, it will be helpful in exploring more and more locations. So uh, now let's start with the setup. And uh, this is the minimum requirement that will be uh, that will be needing for the implementation of VRC8. Uh, in this project, I'm using XR Interaction Toolkit. And uh, we, I provide the link in the description. And uh, you just have to download it from the package manager of Unity along with the starter assets. And as I told you that I'm using first hand project by Meta and it is also available on GitHub. So in the first step, I'll just open the main scene of the project that is clock tar, and I'll delete the game object that is player. Okay, so you just have to select it and delete it. And then in the search box of the project window, you have to search for complete exa origin setup. Okay, and uh, do you, as you have already imported the starter assets, there will be a prefab and you can just drag and import it in the hierarchy window. So it will look like this. And in this, we have different, different components that can be used for it. So starting with snap turning, in this we have a snap turning script that is snap turning action base. So we have to define the angle also and the turn amount that will be used for turning without moving your head. So I'll show you the script also. So as you can see in the script, we are getting, we are taking the value, the action, and we are setting the angle at which the head is turning. So if we are turning left, we'll be turning left with the value that is 45 degree angle. And if we are turning right, we are taking the right degree angle. So this is the basic working of a snap, a snap turning action based script. Next, so for direct motion, we'll be adding three components that is locomotion system, continuous turn provider, and dynamic move provider. So they are already in the starter assets. So you just have to add them and you can uh, vary your speed according to the moment of your choice. And just by playing the button, you will be uh, moving with the direct motion. And also one important point uh, in the check reference box, you have to pass XRI hand locomotion, XRI hand name locomotion that is available in assets, samples, interaction toolkit, toolkit version and starter asset. So these all are included in the starter asset. So it's uh, good for you if you are beginning in the locomotion space. Next is teleport button. 
so we'll be adding the component tele teleportation provider and we'll be passing our exor uh, origin uh, from the system so i'll just show you the script also so teleportation uh, provider is basically taking the delay so if you want any delay like from moving point a to point b if you want any 5 second delay or 2 second delay to smooth the experience you can add that after that the delay they are calling for various cases so as i told you that you can change the orientation so there are different switch cases if you are changing the world space up then you can uh, select your own uh, orientation else you can change the target up target up and forward or no look, no orientation are oh, your screen screen right now uh, is my screen not visible? No, I just went away. Is it visible yeah. now? Yeah. Now we now we can there see it. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So as I was telling, there are various switch cases in teleportation provider. If we want to have our own orientation while teleporting, we'll select world space up. If we just want the normal default orientation, we can change to target up and target up and forward. And if you don't want any orientation, just going with the uh, de default phase that uh, teleportation anchor is providing, then we have to select the none part. Next, uh, we'll be importing the teleportation anchor. So as you have seen in the video, there are different, different spots that you can place uh, inside your scene and you can create a path with them. So you'll just be adding the teleportation anchor uh, so this is a prefab already there go to project window and search for teleport anchor and you just drag it and you can duplicate it and place it in multiple places so like this uh, i have placed in uh, four teleportation anchors in different parts of the scene and you can you know also uh, name it as library stairs to provide a more human feedback for the future scope, I'll be working on voice-based locomotion. So I'm already working on it. So my aim is to provide a controller-free locomotion in which you will be using your voice command without using any controller. So for example, if I'm saying move ahead, I'll be moving to another teleportation anchor directly ahead of me. And if I say move behind, I'll be moving behind. Next is gaze-based locomotion. So in this, uh, I'll be just uh, viewing at a specific location and I can set a timer like if I gaze for more than five seconds, I'll be teleported to that location. So this is the future scope of the locomotion. And I'm also almost completed the tunneling part of it. It, it is very useful. So it works like when you are teleporting from point A to point B, there is a small window that comes, closes and then opens in front of your eyes. And it is very useful against motion sickness. So this is my future scope. So any questions? Now, this is great work, Shivaman. Um, definitely vital to have different locomotion options to get around a game. Uh, and so I think this uh, should give folks a good overview of uh, kind of the things that are possible. And yeah, I think if we can also manage to, to get ways to more ways of triggering these that are independent of, you know, a, a controller. So things like voice controls, case controls, that'd be even better. But great job. Thank you. Yeah, and just remember too that like that this project again shows that like what Meta put out as the sample doesn't right like obey these requirements. So like building this in and then potentially going back to Meta and being like, hey, you should put this back into the sample. I mean, everyone learns from the samples you know or not everyone but a lot of people learn from the sample code that they get so <clears throat> that's another reason of us showing like implementing it in there like this is stuff that wasn't implemented you know in the um implementations that were put out and so that that's just like another viewpoint too of like we talked about talking with unity but also these these can go back to the sdk um, sample creators too and saying yeah when you teach people how to <clears throat> implement this on a platform you need to be um, 
you know, showing accessible solutions. Yeah. Thank you so much for your feedback. All right, well, we are just about out of time here. Um, I want to thank everybody so much for coming. Um, we will be having the articles that uh, Ibra, Jiba, and Savio uh, are out, out soon. Um, and then, Thomas, there's an uh, uh, Ally VR meetup uh, follow-up yeah. to this, right? And we're going to be posting that. I'm working with Merrill to get that finished right now. But yes, we, we're basically going live with that. Um, it'll be on August 17th. So we'll be... Um, yeah, your feedback and, you know, this this presentation here is going to help with that one too, but we'll be presenting this out to the wider world on August 17th, and we'll let you guys know about that event as soon as it's live. It should be in the next day. Yeah, and then also I'll note, um, if anybody is on here uh, that isn't on our Slack, um, I've just put the link in there. You're welcome to, to join us on Slack. Um, we have an AD-XR-development channel. It's Accessible Development of XR, mm -hmm. um, where we're going to be, you know, talking about what we're going to be um, doing in ADXR uh, going forward. Um, and also, uh, we have another talk uh, coming up um, on, I believe, July 28th. Uh, that is a talk by Cognition on uh, designing for assisted reality and brain-computer interfaces. So. Um, Make sure you check that out. Uh, but I think that's it for now. Um, Thomas, uh, you ever achieve him, Savio? Any any closing words? Come to the Alley VR presentation on August seventeenth. Yeah, but, um, yeah. Like I think, just send us more um, feedback. And I think the, the other thing, which it wasn't going to be realistic today, but just so you know, like you know, Kenji and I's work is to be going through really the dev piece step by step but if anyone else here on the um, call is interested <clears throat> i feel like that's what we really need now is just to be like we're trying to apply the logic from the article into something because that's what we want the outcome to be is for people to take the article and then um, implement this feature into their um, their own project so you know like learn from how it was implemented in first hand or whisper and put it into their project yeah and thanks for the nice feedback here. Yeah, thanks, everyone. All right. Thanks so much, all. Um, we'll put this on YouTube soon, and uh, we'll see you all next time.